What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE Fantasy Football. I am Nick. This is my man Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you're following both of us. You get some value you won't be getting on the YouTubes. Today we are going to do an, uh, an interesting episode. We're going to call it the Blind Resume episode. And this is because we all have biases. I have biases. You have biases. He, she, we have biases. Um, but if you take away the names of these players, a lot of players, right, you might look at things differently. When you're looking at the raw numbers of a player, um, you might feel differently about drafting them. You might take one guy over another guy when you compare the players next to each other. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. So Noah used his masterfully, um, you know, worked on beautiful. Excel skills. Yeah, beautiful charts he made. He put together of uh, whether it's splits, sometimes we took a single player and looked at like weeks X through Y and then weeks A through B or whatever, and they were basically two tails of the same player. Sometimes we put two players next to each other to compare them, you know, some guys that are maybe overvalued, undervalued, or some guys that you might easily take over another guy, but the numbers kind of speak differently to it. So that's what this episode is going to be all about today. Um, and Noah kind of put this whole thing together. So I'm kind of going to let Noah take the stage here. We're going to throw the resumes up, talk about what we see in the numbers, and then we will reveal who the players are and then break it down further, um, whether or not the numbers justify the the bias that we have, have towards these players. So our first blind resume we got uh, on the board is a quarterback. He's 31 years old, so he's not too old, and he's on a big contract, so he's going to be around for a while. Um, he's played eight years in the league where he's been um, a consistent starter. His first two years in the league, he didn't play all 16 games. He was either hurt or he was just benched. Um, he didn't really get his foot in the door to begin his year. And as you look at his consistency numbers, right, 4,200 yards or more in seven out of eight years and the only year he didn't do that was last year, which is why I believe he's being undervalued. 29 or more passing touchdowns in four of eight seasons and two or more rushing touchdowns in four of eight seasons. And as for the top 12 finishes, he's done it six times. And I know 29 or more passing touchdowns isn't too impressive, like four out of eight years. Like 29 passing touchdowns would have ranked 10th this year. But the Pretty fact good. that – yeah, the fact that he added two rushing touchdowns, it's not in each of the seasons he had 29 passing touchdowns. It's – scattered throughout his career it really helped him to finish as a QB1 um, and as for like the volume he had last year in comparison to years prior he still passed the ball 60 percent of the time which is a pretty high number that's uh, better than league average and his pass attempts it stayed pretty consistent but as the league goes more pass heavy um, it really uh, diminished his ranking amongst uh, other people in the league and as for red zone attempts again pretty similar but as offenses are becoming more efficient and pass heavier uh, and moving the ball a little bit better his numbers didn't really match up as to where it did the year prior. And even deep ball attempts, this is a guy who, when we reveal the name, you'll automatically think, yeah, he's a guy who has a big arm. He's going to throw it downfield. Um, he had 14 less deep attempts last year um, than he did the year prior. And if you want to guess in the comments, you can go right now. But you if mean, you were on the deep ball attempts, you have 2019. Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll fix it up. It's, a, it's supposed to be 2017. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'll fix it up for the video. Um, but – if you want to guess in the comments, like who it is and what, like, where do you believe this quarterback would be chosen? Nick, let me just ask you, you already know who it is, but if you saw these numbers of like how consistent he's been and how often he's finished as a top 12 quarterback and knowing he's not like Tom Brady, 40 years old, where do you think like he should be picked just yeah. off these numbers? Based off what you said, based off these numbers, uh, the, the first few things that stand out to me is that he's been a top 12 finisher in six out of eight leagues. And you said last year was pretty much, uh, the first down year. So when I hear that, I want to immediately figure out why. Like, what was last year different than the year prior? Um, and he's 31 years old, so it's not too old for a quarterback. It's probably not his ability or his play that's really uh, going down. The team pass percentage is still high. Pass attempts didn't go down too much. Um, so my, my question would be the weapons around him. Mm -hmm. um, was he as efficient? Is there uh, a trend that we can expect? You know, if the pass attempts went down from 566 to 555, is that a trend that we can continue um, to imagine happening? And 
you said he was a top 12 quarterback in six out of eight years, and he's going off the board at quarterback 25 right now. Yep. So looking at the blind numbers, it would tell me that this is a value, and it seems like someone who's uh, like a low, uh, a buy low candidate pretty much. And I already know who the player is, and this is, <laughs> this is how I would label the player. Um, but I would, I would really try to dive into, like, what was the reasoning behind his down year last year? So yeah. we can reveal to them who it was if you want. Yeah, it's – the player is Matthew Stafford, and obviously he had a terrible year. He was probably taken – I don't have the numbers from last year's ADP off the top of my head, but I'd say he's probably taken in the QB, like, 10 to, like, 13 range just because he has been – Last year he got up to almost – I think he was in the single-digit ranges because he was someone that was, like – had been coming off of six or seven straight really strong years, right? And everyone was like, oh, this is, like – one of the the best buy low values for quarterback like if you're going to wait for a late round quarterback Matt Stafford is you know that guy um yeah. and then kind of based off my presumptions was like you know the weapons group the coaching staff like what happened last year and I think a lot of the things are explainable to um write the narrative of why we would think he would bounce back in 2019. Yeah, news just surfaced that he played, like, most of the season with broken bones in his back. And we saw, what was it, Carson Wentz, I believe he had also had broken bones in his back, and, like, he couldn't do anything with that. Um, and not only that, I remember the first week of the season when they were playing the Jets, the guy got absolutely demolished, and he was, like, limping off the field. He, he dealt with injuries the entire season. They shipped off his number one target, Golden Tate, halfway through the year, and I have the splits before and after. Um, he's putting up, like, 23 points without him as opposed to – or 23 points with him as opposed to 13 and a half without him. And I know 22 and a half isn't like great, but it's much better than 13 and a half, which is obviously the latter half of the season. So those numbers really stick in your head and plays into that whole recency bias where you're like, oh yeah, Matt Stafford, that guy sucks. He couldn't do anything. Well, he's without, without his like number one target. Right. Marvin, he's without Tate. He's without Marvin Jones. Yep. Yeah, Marvin Jones yeah, towards Jones. ACL. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Carry on John. No, Marvin Jones tears ACL. He had a, uh, Something in his, his yeah, knee. something in his knee. He, he had like a, a bone bruise or something, a weird bone bruise that he needed to get surgery on. That's what it was. Because I remember talking to Doctor Morse about it, and he said it was funky, but he expects him to be a hundred percent. But yeah, I mean, the entire weapons group got decimated. I think I think the real question becomes with Matt Patricia at the helm and and Bevel coming in as the OC, will this trend of lower passing volume continue? Uh, and Stafford, I've got, I've got a point for that. So Daryl Bevel, the common narrative is like he's a run-heavy guy, and we've seen that throughout like his coaching. Can I guess your point? Because I don't know what you're going to say, but I have a feeling that it is that the rush attempts or the rushing volume is not actually that high, but he's had AP and Marshawn Lynch as his running backs, and they're just so fucking good. Not only that, but the quarterbacks he's had, he had Tavares Jackson in Minnesota, and he also had Tavares Jackson in Seattle. And Matt <laughs> Stafford is a much better passer than fucking Tavares Jackson. That's interesting. And, okay. And as you said, like, they had these two, like, probably top 10 running backs since, like, 2000. These, like, really good running backs. They had solid defenses. Detroit isn't known for their defense. And they know – like, Bevel knows what he has in Stafford. He, has a, he knows he has a guy who can actually uncork the ball, throw it downfield. When Brett Favre was under Bevel, he threw for 500 yards – or 500 attempts twice. And over his last three seasons with Russell Wilson, he went over 500 yards. So I don't think it's just – you should make the assumption that because Bevel was pass-heavy – it's just because that's who he is. It's also like the weapons he had around him. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, because it's a narrative that you hear, you know, you think of Bevel's time in, in Seattle, right. And then you think of what they're doing in Seattle now. So you kind of attribute that with exactly what they're going to do. I think this, I think if they give Stafford the volume, he could easily creep back into the top 10 of fantasy quarterbacks because for sure, yeah. when you talk about the weapons group that was decimated last year and then look at what it is now, Right, it's, it's Kenny Galladay. It's it's Marvin Jones. I, I even think Danny Amendola is going to be a good fit for the slot just to take over. You know, sixty or seventy percent of the production that Golden Tate would put up. Carry on Johnson, um, T.J. Hawkinson coming in as a great red zone weapon. Like this is a really, really underrated, solid offense. And their offensive line was ranked really highly for pass blocking too. And that's been the focus of them building up. But I will say, you know, they do talk. They have been talking about like the rumors and the reports have all been saying that they want to run the ball a lot. They want to run the ball a lot. They want to run the ball a lot. Um, I just think their their passing game weapons are too good for them not to do it. So sort of, you know, similar in Minnesota where you want to run the ball a lot, you want to run the ball a lot, but you're also paying Thielen, Cousins, and Diggs like $200 million, you know, between the three of them. So um, you want that to be the game plan, but at the end of the day, your best weapons are in the passing game. So it might force it. And if not, that probably means at a lower volume, Stafford's efficiency will be, you know, through the roof. Yeah. 
we, we've seen how good he could be early in his career when all he had was Calvin Johnson. And Calvin Johnson is probably as good as Marvin Jones and Golden Tate combined. But, like, with one weapon, he was putting up 5,000 yards, like, passing. He did that one season. And now he has, like, two legitimate outside receivers in uh, Galladay and Marvin Jones, a slot presence, the best tight end of his career, unless you're, like, a Brandon Pettigrew truther. And a running back who, like, last year they were leaning on uh, LeGarrette Blount on first and second downs. He couldn't He's catch averaging, a- like, 2.8 yards a carry. Like, what is yeah. Matt Stafford going to do with that? And he couldn't catch a pass. Now they have on Johnson, who was on pace for, like, over 50 receptions on first and second downs. So if they do decide to – uh, throw the ball in one of those downs, and he's out there. It's not a complete liability to dump it off to him. So There's I think more passing yards this year, Baker Mayfield or Matt Stafford? I think Matt Stafford, just because, like, everybody loves Baker Mayfield, but they did become a lot run heavier, and I guess you could say the same thing for Stafford. But I think they just have, like, a better running attack with Nick Chubb than on Johnson, where Nick Chubb isn't going to get, like, the pass out of the backfield, and they're probably going to try to, like, hammer it, like, by the red zone and all that stuff. Whereas on Johnson, I could see getting, like, 12 to 15 carries and then, like, three or four targets. I just think overall Stafford's going to – he uncorks the ball downfield a lot, and I just think that he has more upside through uh, passing yardage. Yeah, I think I think Baker will have more touchdowns, more passing touchdowns, but I think I think they'll both be probably around 4,300 passing yards, give or take 100, one way or the other. But that's the thing. Like, you know, when you think of all this hype and this upside, like Baker realistically is a sophomore quarterback, right? Mm-hmm. I know like, like brand new OC and everything. There, yeah, there have been – um, I mean, well, yeah, yeah, the, Todd Munkin coming in there. Um, I, I mean, there have been successful sophomore quarterbacks, of course, but like 4,300 yards and 30 touchdowns is an incredible year for a second-year quarterback, right? So, you know, people are – I see some people really like ranking him as like the quarterback two or three in fantasy this year. And it's like, you know, that's, I don't think that's realistic with the numbers, with the numbers that like Luck and Rodgers and Mahomes are going to put up this year. So I don't know why this just turned to like a shit on Baker Mayfield. Thing. <laughs> But I, but I like uh, I, I like where Matt Stafford's spot is right now in ADP, and he's someone that I'm definitely uh, looking to target at the end of super flex drafts. And the other thing I want to put in real quick, let's move to the next one after this, but he, he the reports came out that he broke his back. We don't know when exactly that happened, but we know he was put on the injury report in week 14. And when you look at the splits, 1 through 13, and then weeks 14 through 17, they are – drastic right they are really big the passing volume dips by about seven pass attempts um at the yardage the touchdowns they all dip pretty much in half so that would explain the end of the year drop off you know if he doesn't have that drop off if he continues the pace over the first 13 weeks you're probably looking at Matt Stafford finishing within the top 15 quarterbacks and maybe you're not thinking about him the same way so again it's always always smart to put things into context yeah it's just the whole recency bias thing so exactly. um we're gonna hop off matt stafford and we're gonna move on to the next blind resume and this one's a little bit different it's comparing two different players so they're both receivers and they're both fairly young the guy who's been in the league three years is probably only one or two younger year, uh, one or two years younger than the guy who's been in the league for five years but you look at like what they've produced in their time in the league i will say player wide did miss an entire season due to an injury but i mean you should be taking that into consideration when like evaluating him as a prospect um so top 24 seasons they both only finished in that range once player y was a wide receiver one one uh, for one year 700 yard seasons uh player x did it 66 percent of the time player y has done it 60 percent of the time 100 target seasons the same amount last year this is starting to jump into like what we saw um last year in 2018 player x actually had more red zone targets and had a higher red zone target share than player Y. And after when we like reveal the names, this probably will stand out to you just knowing who the players are. Um, overall target share, player X did um, have a little bit lower of a target share, about 18.6% compared to 21.9. And player Y only played in, I think, 12 or 13 games. So these numbers are adjusted for that, not like overall, because it would obviously be a lot lower because he didn't play in three games. And the thing about that target share, though, is if you look at the teammates player X had compared to player Y, Player X had to compare, had to like share a field with two guys who had over 100 targets, whereas the other guy didn't have anybody that, uh, I think he had one other teammate that uh, reached 90. So there's a lot less competition, and he still had a, a high target share, which just goes to show that this offense was a little bit more pass heavy. There was more opportunity for him to succeed. And even the QB play, um, ne- neither was really elite. And I know these fan bases might get a little pissed off when we release like who they are. Um, I'll give you a hint. Snacks is probably like throwing his unplugged headphones on the ground right now, <laughs> but the completion percentage is about the same. And the QB yards per attempt are about the same. And as for their ADP, these guys are separated by almost three rounds and like 11 wide receiver picks. 
I don't think these guys are as far apart as these as their ADP really shows right now. I thought they were until I saw this. Um, a few things that stand out to me, knowing the players, um, I'm actually going to keep the chart up on the screen, but I'm going to release the names of the players. Mm-hmm. Player X is Sterling Shepard. Player Y is Allen Robinson. The first few things that jump off to me is that Allen Robinson has one top 24 season in five years. And I know you said that he yeah, missed his ACL. Yeah, I didn't need you to actually – Tell me that because I, I, I think I knew that. But My bad. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it was like dumb <laughs> that I said that, like, you know, you said that he tore his ACL, but I, but I knew that. Um, so he has one top 24 season, but, like, everyone – he will always have hype. He will always be someone that people will buy into. Uh, the other thing that stands out to me is Sterling Shepard's red zone target share. 23% is a very high number. And the last thing that stood out to me is the QB completion percentage and yards per attempt. So Eli Manning versus Mitchell Trubisky. When you're looking (laughs) at those numbers, they suggest that they were similar. And I think this is a really good point for when we're talking about biases because you think of Mitch Trubisky and you remember, you get really excited about the year he had last year. But don't forget that he was not good throwing the ball. As you can see, he was on par with Eli. Yeah, Mitch Trubisky Trubisky ranked him like 37th or something ridiculous. Don't don't hate me if like that's a little bit lower than it should than like it actually was. But it was like in the 30s. Like he wasn't a good quarterback. No, he he was really bad last year throwing the ball. His touchdown to interception ratio. The two things that 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 people are looking at that make them you know want to buy into Trubisky is one the touchdown to interception ratio uh, was really good, right? And two was his, he had fantasy, fantasy games that were monsters. And the majority of that had to do with his rushing ability. Um, and when you look on player profile, which I'm going to bring up real quick, just give me a second. I remember seeing a stat that was about his interceptable passes, right? And his touchdown intercept ratio was 24 to 12, which is a monster jump from the 7 to 7 he had the year before. 24 and 12. 24 is a very good number of passing touchdowns. Especially for a mobile QB like that, yeah. Right. So he threw 12 interceptions on the year. But per per player profiler, he threw 26 interceptable passes, which was the sixth highest on the year. So you're looking at the discrepancy between the number of interceptions and the number of interceptable passes. I remember watching a lot of the Bears games and seeing him throw the ball so many times into coverage where it should have been picked off and defenders just dropped it, right? So when I look at the touchdown-interception ratio – I think it's probably going to be a lot closer to like 20 and 18 in 2019. Yeah, Eli Manning. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like 19 to 17 in, uh, in 2019. And, you know, people just look at the raw numbers and get confused. But when you look at, you know, just the actual, the, 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 the advanced numbers, like interceptable passes and, and things like that. And then you look at the fantasy numbers, right, on a points per game basis. People remember we put him in their lineup that like four or five game run where he went off, but he was averaging, you know, he was going 53 rushing yards, 47, 81, 51. And people remember him as a great fantasy asset. So they're like, oh, he was a pretty good quarterback overall. That's not the case. He was just really good running it and he got lucky. That's really what it comes down to in the passing game when it comes down to those stats. But looking at the predictive stats in terms of interceptable passes, in terms of yards per attempt, you know, versus a guy like Eli, where you think of him as a horrible passer at this point in his career, that's really bad news for Allen Robinson. It's like, can Mitch Trubisky be accurate throwing the ball outside of the numbers? Like, sure, anyone can deliver it over the middle to the slot, to running backs, to tight ends who are running mesh routes and things like that. But can you get the ball to an Allen Robinson type? So, you know, I've been waiting on someone to, like, sell me on Sterling Shepard, and I'm not sure that this actually sells me on him, per se, because I don't think I want to buy into anyone in the passing game in in New York, maybe Evan Ingram. But I – I'm getting more and more off of Allen Robinson the deeper we get into the offseason. Yeah, and as you brought up, like, the throws outside the numbers, you look at who Chicago has now. Like, David Montgomery is a guy who can catch passes on first and second down when he's out there, which Jordan Howard couldn't. Um, In the slot, they're going to have Anthony Miller, who, like, played all season with, like, a separated shoulder or something ridiculous like that. He's going to have, like, I'd say at least 80 targets this year. And even Taylor Gabriel had, I think, 93 last season. So it's not like he has no competition, not to mention Trey Burton. And, like, for a quarterback who's not accurate and who may never, like, make those throws down the sidelines, which we somehow saw out of Blake Bortles for that season where he had 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns, like, comparing that to what Sterling Shepard has, I brought up he had two uh, two other players on the team with over 100 targets. One of them's out of town. That was Odell. 
And you could argue, and I'd probably agree with you, that uh, Evan Ingram's going to have over 100 targets this season. But him having over 100 targets compared to what he had last year and the addition of Golden Tate, I don't think matches the, the competition he had by having Odell there and what Evan Ingram was already bringing. And then mm-hmm. I know he's going to be on the outside a little bit more, and we haven't seen much of him on the outside. So I don't have any like big facts to back up that he's going to be a good outside receiver. But he'll at least have the volume. And for fantasy football, that's kind of what you're chasing. And I know like the, the combination of Daniel Jones and Eli Manning is the most favorable thing. And I'm not saying I would choose uh, Sterling Shepard over Allen Robinson. I just think the disparity between these two players who are in kind of similar situations, like I wouldn't be surprised if their target numbers are within like 15 to 20 of each other. And at that point, I'm not sure I'd be taking Allen Robinson like three rounds ahead of a guy who's going to probably put up like similar numbers at the end of the year. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's it's so tough to get a grasp on what's going to happen in that New York passing game between him and Tate because Tate's – Tate's a piece of his offense. Like, we never really saw a dominant slot receiver in New York, right? When you think of the wide receivers in New York, you think of Odell, you think of King Nix, you think of Plaxico Burris, like those guys, you know what I mean? It's like, those are downfield threats, and that's where Eli has kind of flourished throughout the prime years of his well, career. Victor Cruz a little bit, but yeah, that's that, that boy could sell so. Yeah, he was good. He was, uh, he's not Golden Tate at 32 years old. So, <laughs> we'll, I mean, we'll have to see where it goes. Sterling Shepard's definitely going to be playing the majority of his routes on the outside while Tate operates on the inside. And I can't remember uh, – I was listening to a pod this week. I think it might have been Roto Worlds, and they dropped a stat about Sterling Shepard on the outside. It was not good, though. It was, it was something about his production when he was on the outside. It wasn't, it wasn't good, but I think they will use a lot of their pieces interchangeably. Um, but I, I think the overall point is is maybe, you know, Allen Robinson and, and Shepard, the fact that they're going so far apart, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be the case. And maybe it's time to kind of step back on a guy like Robinson or maybe step up on a guy like Shepard. Like, he could surprise us and end up with – he could be the number one target there and end up with 115, 120 targets. And, like, if you're going to get that in the 10th round, that's, you know, it's ridiculous value. Yeah, and it's not like last year he was in the best situation either, and he still put up, like, over 800 yards. So I think a floor for him is, like, 700 yards. I just – like, he's a high floor player that you can get in, like, one of the later rounds who you could throw in your flex when you need to. And yeah. as for Allen Robinson, he's kind of a boom-bust guy where, like, that one season sticks out in your head, and that's why I made, like, a blind resume on him because if if instead of that 1,400-yard, 14-touchdown season, like, I don't even think he'd be, like, a top 35 receiver. Yeah, it's, it's just the yeah, people will keep going back to that one season. And it's like, he's an athletic freak. And he probably would be, you know, a top 15, if not top 10 wide receiver, if he was in a different offense. But the fact of the matter is, is he's with Mitch Trubisky. And this offense is not going to support a high end number one wide receiver, they're going to be dumping it off to their running backs a lot. They spread the ball around a lot. Trubisky for one just doesn't pass the ball a lot. A lot of his dropbacks end up turning into rushing attempts. It's just it's not a good setup for Robinson. So if you're thinking that he can return good value on where you're getting him, it's probably not the case this year. Yeah. And on the flip side, we're going to move to a different blind resume. And this wide receiver does have a very good quarterback who will be named shortly. But you look at who this guy is and what he's done. He's been in the league five years. He's missed 18 games, so that could kind of give it away already. That's over three per season for you math heads out there. It's, it's not as uh it's not as many as I thought it would be, to be yeah. honest. I thought you missed more than that. Maybe it's like a T.Y. Hilton thing. I didn't look into it, but like you leave games early and stuff like that. Like well, last year he had the one game where he was active. He was ruled active, and I don't think he stepped foot on the field. So he's probably had multiple ones of those. Yeah. Um, and along with that, right, two 600-yard seasons, two six-touchdown uh, seasons, and those didn't come in the same year. Like he had a six-touchdown season where he didn't have 600 yards. Um, only one season with over 100 targets. And in fantasy football, as I said with Sterling Shepard, you're looking for volume, and this isn't a guy who, whether it be him not being on the field or him just not demanding a lot of looks, he hasn't gotten over 100 targets more than once in his career. Um, this stat, I'm not sure if it shows anything, but I was just like going through it. Um, games with 70 or more receiving yards, just like 33% of his game started his career. And I looked at Julio Jones. I believe last year he did it 11 times. Mike Evans was like 10 times. And then a guy like Tyler. Yeah, Julio had 10 separate games of 100 yards. So yeah, he was, so maybe it was a little bit more. Maybe Mike Evans was 11 out of 16, something like that. And then I looked at Tyler Lockett, and I think he was 7 out of 16, which is – or no, a little bit less than that. He was, like, at 30%. So um, this guy, this isn't a guy who you're looking at too much consistency throughout his career. And, like, the more pre- um, predictive stats, I guess if you want to call it, like air yards and yards per route run, very pedestrian numbers, 33rd in yards per route run. Um, air yards only 269 in 10 games. His target share was low. 
He was only like really reliable three out of 10 games. And this was a guy who you're probably drafting in the top 30 receivers last year. And then fantasy points per game, he was 32nd among receivers who played at least as many games as him. This is a guy who throughout his career, he's had a lot of hype. And um, there's, there's another circumstance as to why he's being picked this high. But this is a guy who, when you hear his name, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that guy was chosen super high. And he had a couple pretty good seasons where he showed like his upside. But it's also a guy who's missed a lot of games throughout his career. And it's also somebody who, on a week-to-week basis, I'm not sure you're going to feel comfortable slotting into your lineup if one of these situations that I mentioned like pans out. Yeah, I think, uh, I think if we threw draft capital in here too, it would mm-hmm. probably give away who it was. Looking at the blind resume, if, you know, if I didn't know who this was, I would look at it and be like, okay, so we have an injury-prone player who has literally not really produced in his career. Like, I want no part of him. But he's going off the board at wide receiver 21. 51st right. overall, or like 54, something like that. 51st overall. So this is a guy that, like, if you have no bias, you should not be taking this year. You should not be drafting anywhere near a top 50 pick inside the top 20 wide receivers. However, he is tethered to a guy named Patrick Mahomes, and this receiver is Sammy Watkins. Um, and you're going to hear, the, you know, he's had a, play, a played out narrative and a played out storyline. It's like you have to ask yourself at one point, do you just say enough is enough? And if you're good enough, you'll have put up the production. And I've heard podcasts where literally people go year by year breaking down or making excuses for why this guy hasn't produced in every single year. And a lot of them are valid, granted. But eventually, you know, you just get it done. Um, and I think he would have been really good last year had he not gotten hurt. But again, that's been such a, a big role in, in the story of his career. It's, it's foot injuries. It's all these lower body injuries. Um, and the news about Tyreek Hill is what's propelling his ADP all the way up the board. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen with Hill, right? The criminal case was dropped, but that has nothing to do with what the NFL can do. The NFL can give Hill 16 games suspension if they want to. Right. And honestly, it's not out of the realm of possibility. So would you be more surprised if he suspended 16 games or not suspended at all? Would I be more, uh, I'd be way more surprised if he wasn't suspended at all. I think, I still think he's getting like eight games minimum. That's what I think. I think like half the season, just to like really set an example. Yeah, um, I yeah I, w- I would I would be surprised if he got 16 games, but I would be more surprised if it was zero. Um, Sammy Watkins is a guy that like something I've been saying for or a couple months now is like you want to be risk averse the earlier you get into your draft, and it's like that fifth round is probably the borderline of where you can start looking for players with more upside, and Sammy Watkins fits that bill, but you know. Y- there's a very good chance that he misses six or eight games this year because it's just a constant theme throughout his career. Uh, and we also don't know, like the other thing is like, if you're drafting him that high, knowing he has the injury concern, you're kind of just throwing out the fact that he might just not be as good of a receiver as his draft capital suggested. We haven't he, seen him be a good receiver in like since Buffalo. Exactly. And like, you look at the production, like you said on the chart, it's, it's, it's not been there. He hasn't had many good seasons, especially not recently. So, um, a lot of people are like, okay, if he'll miss his time, then that means Watkins is a shoe in to be like a wide receiver one, a high end wide receiver two. But it's like, says who? You know, like, what have we seen that actually tells you that that's about to happen? What I will say, though, is when he was back in the playoff, I think in the games last year he played where he was at full strength and like the team was at full strength, he produced at a, at a pretty high level. He produced at the level that, you know, his contract said that he should be producing at. I think it was when they originally signed him last offseason, it was like three years, nearly $50 million. So they had plans to have him very involved in this offense. Um, and I still think that will be the case if he is healthy. And when he got, when he came back for the playoff games last year, he had eight targets in both playoff games. I think he went like four for a hundred in one of them. And then like six for 60 and a touchdown in the other one. And I think those are, you know, maybe numbers that we could see, um, you know, 60% of the time. And it's something that I'd like to buy into, but it's not someone I'm going to reach for. Like if Hill's out for eight games, I'm not going to be taking Watkins within the first three or four rounds because the risk factor coupled with the fact that we don't actually know his upside is is just a lot of things piled on top of each other. Yeah, and another thing that's concerning for me is Tyreek Hill, the recent news of him, like, they're not pursuing it any further or whatever the deal is. His ADP in the last two weeks has went from, like, 100th off the board to 54.6. So he's jumped 50 spots. In that same time, Sammy Watkins have, has fallen from pick 48 to pick 51. If, if Tyreek Hill is jumping that high... Sammy Watkins should be falling a lot lower unless the people who are drafting Sammy Watkins are dead set and like 
their stance thinking that Tyreek Hill isn't going to play. You can't have the number one wide receiver on this team jump up like five rounds while having their number two only fall back like half a round. Yeah, like I would love to – in the beginning of the summer, I would, I would prefer – say Tyreek Hill was playing 16 games. We knew that. I would love Sammy Watkins in the eighth or ninth round compared to Hill being out 10 games and having to take Watkins in the third or fourth round. I would literally rather the, the first scenario because, like I said, when he was healthy on the field and they had that offense at full force, Watkins showed out, right? He balled out and he played well. Um, but so many variables go into the equation with the Hill thing and with Watkins' injuries and stuff. So somewhere lower, like, you know, the lower risk it has to be, um, I still think he provides ample value later in the draft, but he scares me in, the, in those early to mid rounds. Yeah, there's just so many question marks with, like, not only his injuries, but he's not going to be the number one receiver on this team because they have Kelsey. But, like, the fact that Tyreek Hill could come back this year and maybe Miko Hardman is, like, what they picked him to be if Tyreek Hill is off the field, there's just, like, so many variables that could make him, like, not return value or return his, like, ADP. I, I just – I'm not going to touch him as long as, like, he's within those, like, top probably 70 or 80 picks of the draft. Yeah, wow. You're going all, all the way up there, 70 or 80 picks? Yeah, I just think, like – I was going to say, I'll put a hard mark. Like, don't touch him in the first three for sure. Um Top four rounds is probably off the board, too. I would say around where his ADP is, like 50-ish, is the first I would even consider looking at him. Yeah, I just – guys like Christian Kirk probably don't have, like, the same upside. But, like, I'd, I'd honestly have a tough time deciding between those two. And I know it might sound crazy, but, like, I just – I expect a lot of, out of that Arizona offense, and I just don't know what to really expect out of Sammy Watkins this year. Yeah, I think there's a lot, a, a lot more risk than there is upside that people are kind of making up. Yep, and – Moving on to a position everybody loves, especially if you're playing tight end uh, premium leagues. It's the tight end. You guessed it. Um, <laughs> it's two guys who, um, if you look at the snap share, they're both on the field over 80% of the time. So these aren't like Eric Ebron types who play like 40% of the time. You can expect these guys to be on the field a whole lot. Um, they're finished last year. They were nearly identical. Player X um, edged out player Y. And as we all know, tight ends, if you're separated by two spots, it's probably one touchdown. This is so crazy knowing who these players are and, and seeing these numbers, like how they both finished as top nine tight ends, and they both yeah. like didn't do shit last year. Yeah, tight ends suck. It's ridiculous. That's how close the position is. Yeah, I mean, like the snap share, they were on the field a lot of the time. The target share was, you know, there for like a low-end tight end one number, um, not as involved in the red zone for one as opposed to the other. But like overall, it, it, they're messy – their their messy profiles. Yeah, and just by looking at like all these numbers, everything other than like pass attempts and like slot targets, like everything is identical about these players. Yeah, like, and I think I think looking at the slot targets could be a, a giveaway on uh, who these guys are, or well, at least who player X is. Um, I guess like in relative speaking, you won't know that twenty five uh, slot targets is a lot, but um, imagine it is, and think of a tight end that finished inside you know the top. Um, eight tight ends or whatever, and was playing in the slot a slot a lot because he was a move tight end, right? So we have two guys looking at these numbers. Um, I mean, they both seem okay to me. Doesn't look like two guys I would be targeting. Um, I, I didn't make this for like one guy's better than the other. I'm just making this showing that like neither guy's that great, and there's like a huge disparity between their ADP right now. Yeah. So you have you have player Y going at tight end ten, eighty eight overall, and then player X who actually finished higher than player Y last year going at tight end 13, 40 picks later at 128 overall. Okay. I see what, I see what you're doing there. Um, yeah. So this is, this is Trey Burton on the left and it's David and Joku on the right. And I, I like that you put these guys in here because they're actually two guys that I kind of want no part of in, in fantasy this year. Um, I've, you know, been on the record talking about how I want no part of Trey Burton, but the fact that David and Joku is going so high, like that needs to be the vocal point I think here is because, uh, David Njoku, I tweeted something out uh, a month or so ago. I forget what the stat exactly was, but it was like David Njoku has I, – I think he has yet to have over 75 receiving yards in a single game yet in his career. Wow. And he's played in like 32 career games so far. So it's like there's a lot of hypothetical upside baking to him because of his athletic profile. But on the field, he has really not had great production. Um, and – We've heard reports of him struggling as a blocker. So is it possible he's off the field, you know, for – They bring in – um, what is it, Demetrius Harris, right? The, like the 6'8 guy. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's a, a good blocker and he's monster. huge. He's yeah. a monster. Yeah, they bring in OBJ who's going to take a lot of targets. Um, like you said earlier, this might be a run-heavy offense with Nick Chubb back there. 
So I think uh, it, it, the way I look at it is like David Njoku needs to be for, it's not like I think Trey Burton, they, they need to meet halfway. I think David Njoku needs to move way further. I don't think he should be within the first hundred picks. Um, I think that David Njoku, if he's going to have a breakout, he came into the league so young, you know, so he has a lot of time to develop and become a breakout player if he does. If we're going to see it, I don't think it's 2019. I think it's way, way, way more likely to happen in 2020. Um, if we're going to get any sort of consistency, at least. Yeah. Um, first off, I looked up um, David Njoku. Most ever yards in a game is 74 as a rookie and then 73 last year. So you're right yeah, on that. I fucking I, I finesse those stats. I'll be like, he'll never have – he never has a 75-yard <laughs> receiving game, but he has like 19 games of 74 yards. Yeah, yeah. Um, and along with that, as you said, with David Njoku, this whole like name bias, if that's even a thing, like he's a ripped, like young athletic tight end who can go up and like snag crazy balls if he can even catch them. But like he's a guy, when you think of his name, you think of a guy with like crazy upside. He finished barely inside like the top 12 tight ends. He wasn't consistent on a week to week basis. They bring in like a top five receiver in the league, and they're not necessarily the most pass heavy offense in the league. So with all these things working against him, not that I love Trey Burton or I hate David Njoku. It's just these guys are separated by like three and a half, like four rounds. Mm-hmm. I'm not I, – I don't want to pick either, but I'm definitely not taking David Njoku where he's sitting right now. I mean, there's no value in choosing him there unless you believe like OBJ is going to be hurt and uh, Jarvis Landry like blesses him and brings him back on the field or whatever. But like I don't, I don't know. I just – there's no scenario where I'm picking David Njoku as a top ten tight end this year. Yeah, me either. He, and he's been slowly moving back in the ranks. And I think people are starting to notice it because at the beginning of the summer when I was doing best ball drafts, I'm pretty sure Njoku started the offseason at like tight end six or seven. Um, and then he slowly trickled back to, you know, eight to nine. Now he's at 10. And I'd imagine, you know, as more pieces like this come out, he'll probably continue to move back because there are just so many full-time players um, who have, you know, shown production on the NFL field at a higher level, at a more consistent level than Njoku has. And it's fun to think of the, you know, the upside and whatnot. And listen, if you're in a 12 team league and you completely faded the position and you're at, you know, in the 10th round or whatever, and it's like him or, you know, or Trey Burton, like I would rather have Njoku straight up. Um, But I'm not, yeah, I'm not going 40 picks ahead to target someone like Njoku this year. Yeah, I agree with that. Cause it's not like Trey Burton isn't competing with nobody's either. It's like just the fact that they're being separated this far. Like if I was, yeah, it's just in a vacuum. They should like they shouldn't be this far apart. Yeah. Um, the next blind resume is a packed one. It's got three players, so a little extra for you guys out there yearning Dude, for these blind. Fucking resumes. God. It's got a ton of shit, and I'll just I'll just try to sum it up. Right, the first three you can see player Y is a little bit more injury prone. He's missed a ton of games. They're all still pretty young. Their BMIs, player X and Z, are like what the fuck? <laughs> you summed yeah. up with the middle one. I'm confused. Okay. No, I, I'm just saying, like, they're all young, and player Y is the most, like, injury-prone, you could say. Okay. And then, as for BMI, player Y is, like, the biggest of them, but when we release the names, you'll know that none of them are big. Spark scores, athleticism stuff, they're all very athletic. Player Z didn't have one on player profiler, but he's a guy who ran in the 4-4s, four and he's known for, like, breakaway runs and shit like that. Um, yards per carry, X is obviously – this isn't, like – Yards per carry is kind of a deceptive stat, but when you can average five yards per carry through two seasons, that's pretty damn good. And 4.4 is good in its own right, but, you know, five is like that Jamal, Jamal Charles level. Um, receptions per season, none of them are really liabilities in the passing game. Um, seasons with 800 yards from scrimmage. Um, player Z, you can see from like the next few rows down, he's been like the most consistent producer, but X has only been in the league for two years and he's still uh, surpassed five touchdowns and 800 yards for scrimmage. And mm-hmm. he's been a backup for uh, one of those years. Um, breakaway run weight, run rate, which like shows their upside and just breaking big runs. It's um, runs of 15 yards or more divided by um, the amount of carries they have. X and Z are pretty good. Y kind of lacks. And the last time he played was 2017, so I'm using those numbers. Juke rate, um, all low 20 percent or low in the 20 percent. Yeah, so they're all about uh, uh, yeah. around the same in elusiveness. Um, and then when you look at top 24 weeks from last year, we had. The same amount for X and Z and Y was hurt. Almost. Yeah, in 2015, yeah, he – or 2017, did it five times. The thing that surprises me is how far apart these guys are being drafted. Mm-hmm. And should I, should I say who these guys are right now? Because I think that kind of plays a big role into, like, this whole thing. Yeah, well, the first thing I would want to say is I'm, like, looking at this profile, 
it, it would seem to me like I'm I'm immediately intrigued by someone who's played in the league for two years is 20 as young as 24 years old and like you said averages five yards per carry like to me that's that's saying this guy's efficient he could do it in the NFL he's done it for at least not a long period of time but at least you know a good enough sample size considering he's only missed two games in his career so I'm super intrigued because this guy seems like he has a pretty good upside yeah this whole chart is centered around the 49ers backfield we've got Matt Breida uh, all the way to the left player x Jarek McKinnon, player Y, and Tevin Coleman, player Z. The fact that Jarek McKinnon, the only thing he's better at than these other guys is catching passes, and these other guys aren't bad pass catchers. Like Matt Breida coming out of college, I remember last year it was between like him and Alfred uh, Morris going into the season. I tweeted something out like, oh, Matt Breida during his rookie year didn't do too great uh, catching the ball, and even in college. But the guy's averaging 24 catches a season through two years, and that was playing behind Carlos Hyde as a rookie who caught 59 balls that year. Yeah. And, you know, last year he was playing, like, with all odds stacked against him with, like, broken ankles or whatever the hell he played through and Nick Mullins at quarterback. Like, I, I don't think Jarek McKinnon should be, like, the middle player in here. I think he's well, in a way, like, the worst. Like, I agree. Yeah. Uh, you, know. you, couldn't, you couldn't pay me to touch McKinnon this year, even at even after pick 100. I think, like, people need to understand – like, the NFL moves fast, man. I get that he got that contract last year, and he was supposed to be the guy this year, last year, but that 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 is gone. Like, that, the, any chance of him being anything of a featured back is completely gone. You know Shanahan loves Coleman, um, and I don't necessarily love Coleman. And this is – I get this question all the time, what to do with the Niners' backfield. And I always say the same thing. I said, if I'm taking any of them, which I'm probably not, I will take the cheapest one, who happens to be Matt Breida, by a long, long, long period of that draft – and uh, Matt Breida also happens to be my favorite running back there. Like, if they were in a vacuum, I would take Coleman. But Matt Breida is not far behind, and he's far ahead of Jarek McKinnon, in my opinion. Like you said, they're going to use all three. The thing that's been dropping Breida down is, of course, he had that torn uh, – he, like, tore a muscle in his pec right before um, this the OTAs kind of kicked off. So, we'll have to see. I'm not actually sure. I haven't really looked too much into the injury and, and uh, the timetable in terms of, like, what that – um, takes to come back from, but we know Breed is a fucking warrior, so I'm sure he'll be out there for the preseason. I'm sure he'll be out there for the regular season, and he's the most elusive back there. He's the most versatile back in that backfield. Coleman, like, dude, he, I don't know. I, he is so stiff running the ball. Like, <laughs> he is not built to be a workhorse running back, and at the end of the year, we're going to look back, and Coleman might be the running back 19. Breed might be the running back 27. McKinnon, the running back 37, but if you're in a season-long league, honestly just fade the fucking backfield like they people always put up the stats like oh new england running backs always finish you know combined as like the rb7 in fantasy but it's like that doesn't fucking help because you need to actually make sit start decisions in season leagues right and that's going to be the case with san francisco yeah shanahan usually produces good fantasy numbers from the, uh, from his respective backfield but when it's 11 from him eight from him and seven and a half from this guy that doesn't help you whatsoever right yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if, like, halfway through the season we see Matt Breida consistently getting, like, nine yeah. to ten touches a game. And that's, that's the thing. Like, he's so, he's so efficient and he's so good that he always seems to work himself into a bigger workload. Yeah, and that's kind of like that whole Austin Eckler situation. When you're that efficient yeah. and you bring that, met, like, that much, like, breakaway value, if you're getting nine to ten touches a game and you know that's his role, you can throw him in a flex spot. And where he's being drafted right now, if I were to take somebody in this backfield, which, like, through those, like, draft.com drafts, the best ball, I'm taking him like 100% of the time, and I'm not owning any Tevin Coleman just because even if he does finish as the RB19, as you said, like how many games is he going to be a top 24 running back? Like, right, he's going to give you like three games in a row where it's like seven points, and then you're like, okay, I'm not going to start him. And then he breaks off like a 60-yard run, and you're like, fuck, I didn't have him in my lineup. And it's like, it's cool to say that you owned him as the RB19, but that realistically, that's not, that's not how you win your fantasy leagues. And yeah, I'm with you, man. I, I've been hammering Breed on best ball in like – He's, he, I see him in the, like the 14th and 15th round now, and I'm like, this is crazy because he's he's such a good young player. Yeah, he's a great running back, and just the value you can get him for if you want somebody in this backfield, he's the guy I'm taking, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. Next up, we've got another solo running back, and I honestly, tweeted – like, honestly, just – Are you upset? Yeah, I'm upset, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you to skip this one. We're, we're moving on. We're moving on to the, to the last one. I, I'm going to throw it up. It's Jalen Richard. Just look at these numbers and all. Like the, the, the fact that you put Jalen Richard <laughs> is fucking disrespectful to me and, and my family. 
<laughs> the, the, the timestamps in your descriptions would be like Jalen Richard, like 10 seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> 32 minutes and 17 seconds, 32 minutes and 30 seconds. Done. Yeah. If Wait, you wanna... what, what, what was your thought process behind Jalen Richard? Like, I don't want you to tell me anything about Jalen Richard. I don't care about Jalen Richard other than he's probably just as good as Josh Jacobs. But what was your <laughs> – what was the, the purpose of putting him in here? Just was being just fucking make my veins pop out of my fucking neck. So, yeah, I know. I know you just got a pump in, so I thought I could finish you off with this one. But <laughs> I, I tell you what, when I was talking about Matt Breida's like titty fucking tearing, I, I was feeling my pecs, and I was like, damn, I got a good chest workout. Into that. <laughs> anyway, continue. No, the the whole reason I just put in Jalen Rashard is he's the RB sixty six off the board, and he was Shit. sixth. He was sixth <laughs> in the league in receptions last year with sixty eight and. I know they bring in Josh Jacobs and they bring everyone, in everyone. Everyone died in that backfield last year. <laughs> they still had Doug Martin. Like I think they were. Team. I think they were carrying. The, they were. They had like thir- th- three carries a game last year and nine targets to Jalen Richard every week. Yeah, but over look at this split I found over the first six games of the year when Marshawn Lynch was playing, he was on pace for 280 touches. Marshawn Lynch was, and obviously Mark Cooper was there and Jared Cook. Over that span, Jalen Richard was on uh, pace to see 99 targets. That's Wait. all I'm saying. Hold on. The first – the in-split on the yeah. left side is games with Marshawn? Yes. And in those splits, he averaged over six targets compared to games without Marshawn Lynch. Yes. I need to pull up the game logs because I feel like there are uh, like one big. or two games where he had probably like 17 fucking targets. Okay, uh, so – Jalen Richard's a beast. Well, week one he had 11 targets, but – Week two, he had zero. So I guess that kind of – yeah, and then he had seven, five, six, eight, eight. Nick, this no, is why I made blind resumes. I'm taking the names out of this. People don't want to respect yeah. Jalen Rashard. I tell you I tell you what, you know, <laughs> fuck me up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> fuck me up. Jalen Rashard, you earned my respect. He's a beast. Actually, fun fact, not actually a fun <laughs> fact at all. It's a dumb fucking story. I almost went to a baseball game with Jalen Rashard one time last year when I was out in California. This girl that I'm friends with is a personal trainer, and she works out Jalen Rashard. Or wait, yeah, it was Jalen Shard. I thought it was DeAndre Washington for a second. <laughs> I was like, man, that'd be a big fucking L. But she did. And then uh, she went to a baseball game with him and she invited me. And I forget why I didn't go. I think it was because I was like, bro, you're not fucking putting up enough points for my fantasy team. So I faded his ass. But I'll tell you what. Yeah, dude, those numbers are serious. Those are a lot of targets. <laughs> dude, I love it. How this like blind resume just put you in a little spin cycle. <laughs> man, I'm fucked up. <laughs> so should, should I get a little bit more into him? Just like real quick. No, what's the point of it, though? Are you telling me that Josh Jacobs is a fucking fraud, big fade this year? No, I just think, like, with those splits, right, 280 touches the projection for Marshawn Lynch over that span, I don't think Josh Jacobs is going to see 280 touches this season, maybe not even 280 opportunities. And if that's the case, even with Antonio Brown there, those splits are with Amari Cooper and Jared Cook, two guys who aren't there. I, I just think that the volume will still be there for Jalen Richard, who is one of the better pass catchers in the league out of the backfield. And his yards per carry is 5.3. Like, he's he's an efficient guy who – he's in that Austin Eckler mold where if he gets, like, seven, eight touches a game, he could break it big. And in PPR leagues, you're getting, like, was – what is 68 divided by 16? Like, five? Some, around five? It's four. Four something? Whatever. I'm no math major. But that's four, that's decent enough. 4.25. 4.5. Five. five. All right, whatever. Uh, I, I just think that he, he's like a he's a good value pick in the late rounds. Like he's pretty much. Not I've, I've actually, admittedly, I'm only pissed because it's like why the fuck we're we talking about Jalen Richard. But I I drafted him a lot in best ball because um, I think you know I'm someone who's been very vocal about fading Josh Jacobs because I think Jalen Richard is going to play a very big fucking role in this passing game. And it's not to say like I would never draft Jalen Richard in a seasonal league because he's a player that you're not going to be able to depend on week over week. But I. I I cannot wait to be fucking right about Josh Jacobs. I cannot wait to be right about Josh Jacobs. I just got an update from something that says Nick underscore BDGE just upgraded his running back rankings, and Jalen Richard is 42 now. So I, that, that's a pretty good look for me. Uh, all right. Last but not least, I'm if not. you guys have made it this far, throw a thumbs up. Give me a comment. Tell me how right I am about Jalen Richard. Look at this fucking guy turning into <laughs> a fucking businessman over here. By the draft guide, it's above Nick's head. Um, <laughs> The next guy we're going to talk about, or the next guys we're going to talk about, wink, wink, um, player X and player Y, you look at, they didn't play too many games, seven games for player X, six games for player Y. Both are pretty good. Those are like decent enough numbers on per game basis um, or bases. I think uh, player Y had more <laughs> uh, receiving touchdowns, obviously. <laughs> <Big motherfucker>. <laughs> <laughs> this is way too long. Um, Go. Player X didn't really do anything in the receiving game, um, touchdown-wise. But you see Player X, he had a lot more touches. He did a lot more on the ground. 
and other than receiving touchdowns, he did a lot more in the passing game. Evaded tackles are about the same. Red zone carries are about the same. The thing that really stands out to me, other than the touches, are how many times this player finished top 12. Player X did it in five out of seven games. Player Y did it in two out of six games. Five out of seven, that percentage, I'm not doing off the top of my head. Player, it's more than 50%. Player Y, that's 33%. I know that. So this is a guy who, I know top 12 is like that elite of an elite, but when we tell you the names, you're going to know like this is where he's being picked. This guy's currently RB9. And I know top 12 is like something that you don't really expect out of many players. But when you're drafting a top 10 running back, you want that ceiling. And if he's only going to do it 33% of the time, I'm not sure I'm reaching that high to grab him. Um, yeah, so looking at it, player X is a beast and player Y fucking sucks, dude. <laughs> it's it's not very efficient and it's not like – he's not scoring much and I guess he's getting opportunities, but – Here's the thing, yo. I mean, we'll tell him that both of them are James Conner. Like, <laughs> it, it's two splits. It, it's, it's the first half. It's his first seven games and his last six games. So I want to point out um, that – the rushing yards, the rushing attempts, the rushing touchdowns. One thing that really stands out, of course, he had 1.3 rushing touchdowns per game over his first seven games. And this is a stat I brought up a few times. When I'm talking about Juju Smith-Schuster, right, who had seven touchdowns last year, seven receiving touchdowns, Juju got tackled on the two-yard line five separate times. Every single one of those ended up being James Conner touchdowns. Yeah, and I believe James Conner had more, like, uh, goal line rushes than Le'Veon Bell ever had in a season. Yeah, no, it was – I found this stat. Last year, James Conner had more goal line – it was like by – I found this stat in like week 13. It was like by week 13 or week 14, James Conner had more goal line rushes last year than Le'Veon Bell did for the three prior years combined as a starter. So three years combined, all of his goal line rushes, James Conner had. I mean, that just might be the role for him, so maybe that's the thing that he sees. But the fact that, you know, Juju got unluckily tackled on the two-yard line five separate times that all lead it to James Conner's – um, touchdowns, and it's like, you know, all of a sudden you're not looking at James Conner as a guy who's going who's gonna to rush for 15 touchdowns um, and, and play up to what he did last year. And you saw his um, his lack of involvement, like on the ground. We saw James Samuels get more involved, and some of this has to do with injury. But, again, like this is back-to-back years where James Conner's missed serious time with injuries. So um, in the draft guide, too, Dr. Jesse Morse is going to be doing player write-ups, and I told him to do one for James Conner because I don't think anyone ever talks about James Conner. And not to, like – zone in on, on the cancer thing, but I was interested to see if that had any uh, effect on him as like a player and his, maybe like his conditioning overall, which would lead to, because if you look at both injuries he had, they were both at the end of the year, right? So could that be a conditioning thing where James Conner just naturally wears down towards the end of the year because maybe his body is not built to withstand that, those number of hits and that, um, you know, that, that type of volume, even though he didn't really play the, the rookie year, but um, it, it's just something that crossed my mind that I don't think anyone ever brings up with James Conner. Yeah, and right now being taken as the RB9 and, like, all this coach speak is coming out about it being, like, a 70-30 split or, like, some t- uh, some type of split. The fact that he's still being taken this high despite those, like, that, that talk, I don't think he's going to drop much further than where he is right now. And as you mentioned with Jalen Samuels, the last game of the season when both of them were active and when James Conner came back, I think he James Conner had, like, 18 touches or something. Jalen yeah. Samuels had eight targets in that game. Yeah, so, that's my concern. It sucks because it's such a small sample size. It was just like that one game where James Conner came back from a, a three-week injury. So it's like, yeah, they probably eased him in because he just came back off the injury. But it's also like, do we see Samuels be way more involved in the passing game? Is that what we can expect going forward? Um, it's really hard because the sample size is so small. But you also look at the fact that they brought in Jalen Samuels' fucking running back coach from college. It's like the guy – that led Jalen Samuels to have over 200 receptions in his college career that worked directly with him. He was his position coach in college. So you bring him in and it's like, you're not going to find a guy that knows how to utilize Jalen Samuels in the passing game better than this guy. Right. And I think his name is uh, Faulkner something Faulkner from NC state. And I, I'm not, I'm not sure that we'll see Jalen Samuels eat into James Connors is like workload as a pure running back. But the fact that they lost Antonio Brown, tells me that, I, you know, they'll use both of them on the field at the same time. They might even start using two tight end sets, you know, with Vance and Jalen Samuels together, um, both as, like, weapons. So it, it's going to be an interesting Pittsburgh offense, but I'm, I'm not looking to draft James Conner within the top ten running backs this year for sure. Yeah, and not even just the emergence of Jalen Samuels, but this is a team that, like, threw the most they have ever thrown last year, and they were, like, a really good offense. 
I'm not yeah. sure with AB gone and just like everything just like this whole team just seems like a mess, like in the locker room or whatever. I'm just not sure they're going to be the same team this year where they're going to have that many like goal line carries for uh, what's the name? James Conner just run it in from two yards out. Yeah. And I think that was such a big part of his game because like, I don't know, you look at the rest of him as a running back. It's not like he's creating all these yards by himself and he's like an explosive back. I mean, he's good, right? He's transformed himself from his rookie year to his sophomore year, but like it say his, it, that's the thing. It's, there are very few backs who can really be a stud fantasy running back without workhorse touches, right? Do you have like Alvin Kamara, who's a beast, but getting 17, 18 touches a game. If James Conner's workload drops down to 16, 17, 18 touches a game, like he's going to have a lot of games where he goes 16 for 63, catches two balls or three balls for 20 yards. Um, I guess Sony Michelle's stat line, like he's not going to be as involved in the passing game as he was last year. And if that is like, like the Pats weren't a bad offense last year, but Sony Michelle, like you were just banking on him getting in the end zone or getting over 100 yards, and that's kind of what you expect. Like that's what you need out of James Conner. I think James Conner will be way more involved in the passing game than uh, than Sony than Sony was. But my concern is like you look at his raw numbers from last year, and you're like, oh my god, like 75 targets, 50. Like raw data, you know. But in terms of what he did with those numbers. Uh, a good pass catching running back could have probably turned what he had into a lot more. And I think the Delta between like what you're giving up by letting him have those uh, in terms of what like Jalen Samuels could do the, the Steelers might realize that, you know, so it's a weird situation. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I was starting to write up an article uh, early round the first in the top three rounds this year, there are 18 running backs going off the board, 12 team league. So half of the picks are running backs. And the article was like the riskiest running back picks within the first three rounds. And I don't want to put James Conner in there because there are guys like Gurley, Devonta Freeman, and stuff like that that are being picked within the first three rounds. Um, but, like, I'm, I'm at the end, I'm doing, like, an honorable mention, like, medium risk level. And I'm deciding whether or not I want to put Conner in there because I think, like, I don't think he's r- that risky because he's got a floor, right? He's going to get a lot of carries this year. But he's risky in the sense that he won't return good value. Like, what happens if his ceiling is as high as the other guys picked around him? Exactly. And that might not seem like a risk, but it's a risk in terms of opportunity cost. And you always have to factor that in when you're drafting players. Yeah, like David Johnson, as I just said with Connor not having that ceiling. David Johnson, at least, I I bet if I threw up a blind resume on him, he'd be, like, fucking pissed. But um, I I, I think – I fucking – I disconnect. I (laughs) disconnect. Um, yeah, he at least has like that receiving upside and he's going to get the goal line carries. Whereas James Conner, we're not sure if he's still going to have that role heading into next season. Like he wasn't drafted to be like a franchise running back, if that's even a thing, but like, yeah. And even going, and even going to David Johnson's point, like last year, you could look at the overall end of season stats and be like, Oh, he was like RB 10, RB 11, but he fucked you because he wasn't actually good on a points per game basis. And like, you don't draft your high end RB one to give you weekly RB2 numbers that screws your team right and that that could very well happen with with James Conner yeah James Conner could be like the RB1 version of Lamar Miller which in that case I'm not really like a guy who's going to get you like 70 yards a week but he's never going to be like a top 12 consistent player exactly he's not like super explosive so he doesn't have those like breakaway runs where even if your volume is down like it was just so dependent on things that you can't rely on being there year over year that's that's kind of the point I guess I'm trying to get to here yeah, and I think that's that's all we got for today. I hope all we got for today. That was long, man. How long did we just run for? You have the time up? I do not. But right now it's Friday. And it's four thirty six, and I think we were started recording around like three twenty. So okay, so that's way an too hour and for Friday something. afternoon. Next time, fucking leave out the Jalen Richards, please. All right, <laughs> waste my goddamn time on Jalen Richard. <laughs> that's all we got for today, though. Make sure that if you enjoyed the video, you go follow both of us on Twitter. Our handles are right below us. You hit that thumbs up button. Um, Drop a comment. Let us know which player of the blind resumes that you were most surprised to find out, like, who it was after we told you um, and, and went through the numbers and stuff. So drop a comment for that. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing everything 2019 fantasy football. Five videos a week every day leading up to your season. We got to figure out an in-season schedule, too. We got to talk about that soon. Um, but that's all we got for today. And uh, we're out of here. So peace. I love you. Guys.